I'm a medical director in the Medical and Scientific Affairs Group in Clinical Pharmacology. And the talk we're going to be giving today is about hybrid studies and early access of patients into early phase drug development programs and clinical research. So I'll probably give you a little bit of a background to my, my own kind of professional career. So I'm a medic by trade. I trained in clinical pharmacology and internal medicine. And in the UK, we uh, set up a clinical research facility and that facility actually ran first in patient programs. So the idea of that facility was to bring in patients earlier into the um, clinical drug development uh, environment. So the talk today is predominantly going to be focused on how we are as a company kind of rising to the challenge of early patient introduction into clinical trials and the key um, differentiators and the key things to think about for companies who are planning their study and their research very early on and how we actually work with um, our clinical trials in, in this arena. So um, I think it keeps cutting out so I'll try and stay still as much as possible and not turn around too much. So challenges in drug development. We know very much, I think everybody who does work in this environment, what the real difficulties are. And the hybrid kind of era has, is a way of helping us to navigate some of these challenges. And the challenges we know are, if we look at first, 10% of drug f development failure may be due to formulation. You've got safety issues, that can be about 20%. Again, something that you can potentially work to um, kind of mitigate that risk as you design and develop your drug. And the other part is 40% um, because of lack of efficacy. So this is the huge kind of section that we try and focus on. And the hybrid model really is focused on helping companies, biotechs, small, medium-sized pharma to use that model, the hybrid model, to actually demonstrate efficacy earlier. We know the conversion rates in drug development are very low. We know that can be very e economically damaging for the company. Therefore, the opportunity to look at patients earlier, to look at proof of concept earlier, is advantageous for obviously the company, the, drug, the actual drug itself, and for potential investment in the future. Other aspects are ec potentially economical. Again, um, the efficacy and investment may well go hand in hand and something we will probably bridge during the rest of the talk. So what actually happens? How do we actually work? There are different levels, obviously, within Covance. There are different groups that work very early on. Um, the term early will appear in my talk again and again. You might well hear it about 30, 40 times. And by the end of the talk, if the one thing that you kind of go away, hopefully you understand my talk, but if you can actually keep that word early um, at the forefront of your mind, it's really, really important and something to think about and share, to challenge your own ideology and how traditional drug development models are actually uh, do work and why we are focused in a different way using the hybrid um, environment to actually challenge that traditional pharma model. Currently, at the, at the preclinical stages, what you often have is a kind of multi-vendor uh, situation where bits and pieces of a research program or a drug development program in early preclinical, when it comes to lead optimization, when it comes to the safety package, regulatory, um, is often disseminated between multiple companies and therefore that can actually prolong timelines. We, uh, as part of uh, our presentation today and uh, in, in the audience today is our colleague Hazel Clay who is part of our early phase development solutions group and we actually have a booth 801 and I'll mention that again at the end and to actually show that actually to try and provide that kind of support and guidance in that early phase under one kind of group is actually advantageous from a business timeline and we're looking at a potentially 30 percent earlier drug development pathway timeline so it's an opportunity to explore 
um, rather than this, as I said, small, small piecemeal approach that we uh, often have with uh, clinical trials. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's gone a bit bright here. Yeah, okay. So we'll move on. So this is the interesting part of the talk. Um, and it's something to kind of discuss and debate amongst yourselves. As I said, um, we can obviously have questions at the end and we do have a, a booth here that you can come and speak to us over the next few days. We will always need proof of concept. So those who are obviously fam familiar with the drug development pipeline, you know, in the clinical space, you obviously have your phase one program. Then you often, obviously, after you've gone through your phase pro one program, you need to start showing and demonstrating that your drug works in patient populations. Those studies can often go on for two, three, four, five months, depending on the molecule, depending on the therapeutic indication. So that happens at phase 2A, and that could be anything between two, four, five years after you started um, down the drug development pathway in phase one. Hybrid studies, bringing patients earlier, it's becoming more and more important. Again, it's a lot to do with economy, but it's also got a lot to do with making sure that these drugs actually potentially can work in your um, target population. So how do we actually do that? Again, it's about challenging your own maybe ideas. It's also about challenging traditional models. And what's interesting about this is that regulatory bodies, whether it be the MHRA in the UK, whether it be the FDA, are encouraging companies to consider proof of concept earlier. They are interested in looking at a biomarker, looking at an exploratory endpoint, looking at efficacy earlier. So it is, in a way, changing the thought process and looking at things earlier in the phase one. And it's not a new concept, but what we are trying to really communicate is that it's a concept that needs to have consideration. And that means the early part, the early engagement, the early uh, preclinical package, the early safety package, the early biomarker kind of package. Everything needs to come into play. Um, if anyone has epilepsy, <laughs> um, so, Okay, um, so what we're saying is proof of concept, is, is tr challenge yourself and consider that we can actually bring this earlier in, uh, in the drug development pathway. And we're going to explore this in a little bit more detail during the talk. Everyone knows and everyone is kind of clear who have worked in the clinical trials environment, the traditional design models. I will make sure that any abbreviations and acronyms I do kind of uh, spell out. So. Um, SAD is your single ascending dose study, MAD is your multiple ascending dose study. And it's very important I do this because the last time I actually talked about SAD studies, I had a psychiatrist in the audience uh, who thought I was talking about depression and seasonal affective disorder. So the important thing about the acronyms is that, you know, if you, if you are unclear, you know, do come and speak to me after. So your single ascending dose study is what we often start with in the first in man environment. And then we often move to the multiple ascending dose study. And that's the way the traditional study design model actually works. The hybrid model starts to bring patients earlier. And it's important to consider, don't, bring, uh, don't try and create a hybrid model just for the sake of a hybrid model. There needs to be um, an advantage that you are giving to yourself, but also a rationale to your regulatory bodies of why you're bringing that patient population in earlier. Therefore, the key part of that is, yes, you can get safety, tolerability, and PK data, so that safety data, tolerability data, pharmacokinetic data, your drug level data in your patient population, but you should look to add a value, an exploratory endpoint, a validated biomarker, um, a, a pharmacodynamic endpoint that may well be suitable for your study. And we'll talk about a couple of case studies at the end where we have actually approached the design in a different way for um, the clients that have come to us with a phase one package. So the hybrid model is a very interesting model, but it needs to be used in the right setting. And it's something that we do think about and we do encourage. 
how do we work with a hybrid model? So if you've got your first in human package, uh, first in human program, and you're doing your single ascending dose um, program, that might be with uh, an oral molecule, um, a small molecule, uh, biologic, then you can potentially, depending on the therapeutic indication, move into patients much quicker. You might need to do a multiple ascending dose uh, program in your healthy volunteer. Sometimes you don't. We've had situations where we've done our single ascending dose and we've moved to multiple ascending dose into our, uh, into our patients quite quickly. Again, a lot to do with the therapeutic indication. Of course, you may need to make sure you've got your safety data, you need to know your drug level data, your PK data, but also you need to make sure your tox package covers that period. So you can't go and do a three-month study in a, in a phase one hybrid program in patients because it's unlikely you're going to have three months GLP tox. However, if you've got one month certainly uh, of tox data, certainly you can look at two weeks, you may even consider four weeks in your, in your patient programs. So it really is something to consider very early on in, in, the, in the right setting. Expanding study designs, I won't really go into that in great detail. There are adaptive elements to any protocol, adding in groups, adding in extra endpoints, Japanese bridging, bridging studies. But the key part of, as again, the takeaway message that is very important for me to um, deliver to you is to consider um, the hybrid model in, in your early phase patient programs in, in the right indication. Regulatory stance um, on phase one proof of concept pa uh, patient studies and hybrid studies. Very interesting. So this slide was actually written by two regulatory experts, one from the FDA and one from the MHRA, because I wanted to be sure that I wasn't actually um, communicating something that isn't actually uh, what the regulatory bodies want. And there is a big push from the regulatory bodies to say, if you're going to include patients, yes, do it. Make sure that the study design is robust. Make sure you obviously have looked after safety. Make sure you have the right um, restrictions in place. Make sure you have the right oversight in place. For example, SMC, Safety Monitoring Committee, or DMC, a Data Monitoring Committee, to make sure that you are doing the right thing, that you've done your single ascending dose, you've done your multiple ascending dose, you have good quality data to move into your patients. The hybrid works very well in certain disease indications, and I think certain um, groups probably already know that. If you're going to go into a rare genetic disorder, if you're going to go into a rare metabolic disorder, the hybrid lends itself very well to that environment because at certain points, you cannot justify continuing to dose many, many healthy volunteers with um, a drug that we're not quite sure what's going to happen in the long term to these individuals. And you want to get into patients earlier. Again, you may have safety tolerability, but at the beginning of your journey, important to consider, have you got a biomarker? Have you got an exploratory endpoint? And that's key when you're writing your study design is that it doesn't have to be a primary or secondary objective as long as it's in your, one of your expo exploratory endpoints. And this goes to the uh, final component about biomarkers. So recently I just spoke to the FDA only last week. Um, and the FDA, are, again, are very, very keen on actually exploring biomarkers. And they actually want some form of formal documentation to advise companies in certain diseases with certain phenotypes of what biomarkers are useful. So they are doing a big program, with, particularly with biosimilars, in particular therapeutic areas, and they want to run large programs looking at a multitude of biomarkers that they can therefore have to then advise um, companies when they are looking at the IND registration or even the MHRA as well. So this is obviously a hot topic. It's the holy grail when you're doing your drug development program, so it's something that needs to be considered. But what I like about the hybrid environment is that the regulatory environment is supporting this. We just need to make sure that we are also following the pathway that the regulatory body wants as well. And therefore, it should be a smoother transition into patient studies. All sorts of technical plumbers. We see that. There's no light on this one. Oh, okay. 
Um, yeah, this is not moving. Oh. Yeah, it stopped. Can't go to the next slide. Okay, should I try? I'm not going to do this again. We'll get there. I'm from Covance, it's quite clear. Um, but I'm not talking about this, really. What I want to kind of demonstrate to you is, my, as I said, my background is from the public sector. My focus is on first in patient studies. One of the reasons I joined the Covance group and my colleagues here is predominantly to push hybrid programs, patient access in phase one, um, and the umbrella design that comes through. Here you've got a group, um, what we call the Integrated Clinical Pharmacology Wheel of Fortune. And essentially it's a platform. That's how I see it. I see it as a platform of specialist leaders in each of those fields and each of those components that are critical in that pathway. Because what we've seen in the clinical trial industry is often you do go with um, a problem and you have to speak to multiple people to get an answer and to get the right answer. And what's interesting with hybrid studies, you've got fantastic scientists, you've got the toxicologists, you've got the phase one pharmacologists and the therapeutic area experts actually all working in one platform. So when we are approached with a molecule, a biologic or a small molecule, we're able to provide the right support and guidance. So the, as I said, the hybrid study and the phase one and the patient study it doesn't it is a challenge to the CRO industry and therefore for us to have that customized approach we have also obviously gone back and tried to work out an internal kind of solution uh, for our companies and clients that we work with. Science is key we know that and the important part of the hybrid setup is something that we've found is robust po project management is key in any kind of clinical trial environment. And similarly, project oversight from the medical side and the scientific side is equally as important. And the important part of when you're working with um, the early phase pharmacology studies, the first in human and then the first into patient, there needs to be a joined ap approach. We need to make sure that we're connected for the therapeutic area experts, we're connected with our PK, our drug analysis guys, our biomarker guys, the science is robust, external partnerships, meaning um, hospitals that actually have those patients that we're working with. So that project management, that kind of oversight is really, really crucial. And we know uh, history has taught us that when you are starting to work in patients in phase one, there's a higher risk. So. If you look at obviously what happened in Northwick Park in 2006, for those who are familiar with the TGN 1412 story, the a biologic that was developed for rheumatoid arthritis patients was given to healthy volunteers. They were seriously ill in intensive care. If that drug actually had been given to patients, those patients with comorbidities and other illnesses would have died. So the important part is this integration of having the right experts to actually work on those hybrid programs very, very early on. The other aspect is what we found, particularly with the therapeutic area experts coming in and working with the early teams and the biomarker teams, is that often they're working in that field or that therapeutic area and they are very attuned to what's going on in the biomarker kind of environment in that therapeutic area. So bringing that kind of knowledge very early on to our clients, to the companies, to the early biotechs has been a very, very useful kind of provision. And ultimately, it starts to connect many dots. So the hybrid model is great for companies and startups, but it's great for Covance because it's allowed a much more cohesive approach into drug development um, and the services that we can provide for our clients. 
And there we go. So how we actually work, are we doing okay for time? For, uh, 10 minutes, so we'll probably go through quickly. So we call it one, one team, one solution. And the, this is probably the key personnel that we work with. Um, and when we're talking about a phase one hybrid program, when we start the setup process and how it actually all flows. And this is really, really important. So you've obviously got the project managers, you've got the medical scientific group, I'm being one of them, you have a therapeutic expert, that might be somebody in rare disorders. It may be a liver expert in NASH, it may be a diabetologist, it might be a metabolic expert. You've got the biomarker group, all working in that transition from the first in human and then into the patient sites where we talk, we kind of mention external partner sites. And that's really, really important that that connectivity kind of carries on. And the important part of that is that when these programs then do go into your larger phase 2A programs, proof of concept, you have the team set up right from the beginning. And that's important, obviously, for Covance because it helps kind of working with the client and the company all the way through into the later phases of the program. But the whole setup is kind of geared to a timeline delivery and with the best kind of advice, strategic guidance, advancement of your asset very, very early on. So we try and provide this kind of wholesale solution right from the beginning. And ultimately, what I find is that drug development and where we work is truly about relationships and relationship building. So once you get to know the people that you're going to be working with, I think that really helps, that you know the individuals that you're going to be working for the next two, three years on your drug development program. Trust is built and everybody's working. Um, on the same page. I'm going to move on quickly because we've only got a few minutes. So these are the therapeutic area expertise that we actually have. Um, it's, 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 it's wide range. So every area that you could probably imagine, um, there is a, what we call a TA expert or a connection from the therapeutic area experts to a key opinion leader, to an academic facility that doing some groundbreaking research, providing uh, tools to look for these exploratory endpoints and efficacy and we connect considerably um, across that kind of range and again we'll talk about two case studies um, at the end today. Biomarkers, I've kind of touched based on this so think early again, think early about biomarkers, biomarkers are going to be very very helpful. Is it novel? Do you need to consider um, assay validation very, very early on. Not just in your preclinical, but how about your patients? Can we do a non-clinical trial investigation medicinal product study, a non-CTEM study to actually kind of recruit patients and do an academic study to get blood samples, to get CSF samples, to get bronchoscopy samples, to get tissue samples? Is that something that needs to be considered? And something we don't consider. We often go with a preclinical, and then we realize that clinical, preclinical biomarker actually has no um, credibility or validity in the clinical space. And therefore, that's where we can provide that guidance and support, whether we do that early on. Again, early, because that can save a lot of time and money um, when you are trying to set up your a phase one study and your hybrid study. Biomarkers, and I really like the idea of diversity in biomarkers, it's not something we think about. Whether it be imaging, yes, we've got oncology. Oncology is, this is a non-oncology talk, but oncology use biomarkers all the time in the form of imaging. We know that, and maybe other tumor markers. But there are other uh, biomarkers that we can use, uh, and imaging is getting better and better uh, for many, many reasons, whether it be functional MRI for CNS conditional mental health um, to PET CT for other indications. Um, you've got physiological biomarkers, you've got biofluids as we talked about, maybe bronchiolar alveolar lavage, we may talk about um, CNS or CSF fluid from the, um, from the CNS. So the biomarker kind of environment can be diverse and again it's important to consider and make it also something that can be easy to test if possible, because that's a, another complexity when we talk about biomarkers. Um, external partner sites, very important uh, for us to consider. So it's something that we will work with our clients very, very early on. You have a drug development program, you have um, a patient population that you are targeting, um, a therapeutic area. It may well be rare, it may well be um, this is really, sorry, um, it may well be rare and it may well be um, a difficult patient population to recruit to. So 
what we are doing proactively and what we currently have is across obviously the US, we're looking at UK, the UK, we'll talk about the model in the UK. Um, we've recently been talking about programs in Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, this kind of collaborative network of sites, not for phase one first in man. What you have is these first in human sites, um, the, these phase one sites, I call them fa phase one kind of centers of excellence that do your first in man. When you're trying to recruit patients and difficult patient populations, you have to target the right hospitals, the right sites to recruit those patients and to make sure those environments are appropriate and it's actually feasible to run your clinical trial programs. So there's this balance over quality and quantity all the time when we're looking at external partner, partner sites. But there's a huge proactive kind of engagement that we have with these external sites. This is an example, um, and it's a clearer example rather than the broad kind of US kind of geography that I sent, uh, sent to you. I'm based in the UK. I know this environment very, very well and how we work. We've got leads. We've got our first in human centers of excellence. And I'm sure you will have similar in Spain and other European countries. And you have hospital sites. CRFs mean clinical research facilities. In those clinical research facilities, they are specialized in particular areas. Newcastle may be in dementia. You've got, got people in London doing amyloidosis. You've got people doing inborn errors of a metabolism or genetic conditions. So what's nice about the, this kind of hub and spoke model is that we can uh, provide that kind of first in human package and that, oh, that kind of rapid single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose process and programs and also start to connect with other sites very, very early on. And this is a crucial part of a hybrid delivery program and to make sure things are actually delivered on time because patient access is a problem and therefore uh, you need a solution. And that's the way that we are working in the UK and across other geographies around the world. Um, I've talked about the sites and I'm going to move on because uh, we've um, come, come really near time. Um, and I want to talk about this, these two cases. And one's an orphan disease area in um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And a client came to us with this design, straightforward for us, uh, single ascending dose. The FE is food effect that we often have to do in healthy volunteer to look at drug exposure. Does um, it does actually food affect the actual concentration of drug that actually is in the blood and therefore there are potential adverse effects with that. And your traditional uh, healthy volunteer multiple ascending dose study safety tolerability PK. So there, the, here we are. We have no efficacy. We have no biomarker. We have no idea of proof of concept. This is straightforward. This is what we did. We looked at the preclinical package. We looked at the science. We looked at what, uh, how we could assist in um, a biomarker that was quite clearly seen in the animal models. And they were very good animal models. And can we validate that biomarker in the IPF patients? So here we have an academic pilot patient study program going on right now, recruiting IPF patients, doing bronchoscopy, because they can have bronchoscopy as part of their uh, kind of clinical pathway of care, and actually getting, without any drug, getting samples of fluid, that biofluid, and actually analyzing the biomarkers. And therefore, we have a novel assay, we have a validated assay, which we can then use in the phase one study. So now you've got part one and part two. Yeah, we can do that. But now we do part three, where straight away, we're now moving into two-week dosing into an orphan disease with patients with a biomarker endpoint. Uh, should I say exploratory endpoint? which is looking very good in the preclinical. Therefore, we're already adding value and changing that. And we're challenging, as you said, a normal phase one, kind of regulatory, this is what we're used to, um, and creating an umbrella protocol, a hybrid design uh, with patients very, very early on. Because we've got the science and we've done our due diligence and we've worked to develop um, quite, a, quite a novel um, study design in the end. So this is where we're up to. So one has no efficacy data, and one has efficacy dates. And we'll talk a little bit about the relevance of that. Another example, not an orphan disease, but chronic kidney disease. And this was looking at calcification that often happens in end-stage renal disease, which is the reason why you have such high cardiovascular or cerebrovascular mortality, uh, morbidity and mortality. Again, standard dose design. 
you have your single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose. But our client wanted um, a single ascending dose in eight chronic kidney disease patients just to look at safety tolerability. There's no value really in that apart from a bit of safety tolerability. This is what we did. So again, in their preclinical models, what they started to show using PET-CT, there was a reduction in calcification at steady state. So we looked at that. And straight away, I, I, you know, hopefully you're thinking the same, and said, why can't we use that in, in, in a patient design? And that's what we've done. We redesigned the whole study. So part one and part two has to exist to an extent. Um, so actually, we, we're going from a single ascending dose straight, once we've done that, into a multiple ascending dose in 12 kidney patients. But we're going to have the imaging to help uh, look at that efficacy. Does the drug actually reduce calcification? Because we know it's happening at steady state in the animal model. So very early on, we'll have all the safety data, um, but we will then be able to move into our patients. And therefore, we've got clear rationale. We have all the oversight in place. And then when the regulatory body, when the MHRA look, look at this, the other one has gone through, but the, when the MHRA look at this, they know that, yes, yeah, the target indication, and they have a clear exploratory endpoint and the imaging will potentially help and therefore escalate um, that kind of drug development pathway. So one, again, efficacy data, no efficacy data, efficacy data. So the question that we get back, and you may well have, well, what if you don't have efficacy data? What, what are the disadvantages of that? And there isn't any. And the one thing is, is that you're managing expectations. If you straight away you are able to go with a hybrid design and an umbrella protocol kind of set up to your investor and say, We're gonna, we think we can bring patients in early. It is likely the investment's going to happen. And the secondly, if you start to see a signal, it's going to increase the value in confidence and obviously economically of your asset straight away. So, and the, even if you don't see it, you still have safety tolerability data in your patient population, which probably gives you confidence to go into patients much quicker into a, into a larger population study in, in your phase two. So I would say there's more advantages than disadvantages. But again, right molecule, right therapeutic area, early engagement. And this really is my final slide. So here we go. Again, top lines, again, to take away. Um, do you have a biomarker? Is it a validated biomarker? Is it something that you can use in your study design? Reproducible pharmacodynamic endpoints. Again, something to consider um, is, uh, do we have something that we can actually add to that study design? Is the patient population accessible? If you're going for the rarest of the rare, it's going to be difficult. But if you do go for a rare disorder, it is likely a hybrid design is going to be the way forward. But what's really important, again, is early engagement to make sure that you are that you know where your patient population is, as I said, geographically, whether it be in Spain, whether it be in another country, however you work. It may be a multi-site event uh, across multiple countries. That's something, again, to, again, to consider. Early clinical pharmacology and therapies to expertise engagement, that is absolutely key. Um, what we find is that we can add value to our clients' designs very early on. And more information we get it, you know, it seems to actually help with that kind of decision making. Efficacy signal, we know, as I said, increases confidence. It may also increase value. And the worst case scenario, you will have safety. Um, pa you'll have patient data. You'll have safety and um, PK, drug level data at a minimum. So in, in, all in all, it is um, a kind of win-win situation. So um, I'm over time by five minutes. I had to skip a few slides and dodge a few light interruptions, but the, we are at 8.01 boo, at the booth, and um, please come and speak to us uh, at any time. And if there are any questions, apart from Brexit, please come and ask uh, us about Brexit. I voted Remain, so, um, but do come in and uh, have a chat with us whenever you want. Thank you very much.